Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the program. Dustin Harris hanging out in the podcast chair. Just a special announcement before we begin the interview today. This may be, it's definitely in the top 10, probably the top three, may be the most important interview I have ever done on the Appraiser Coach podcast. That being said, (laughs) unfortunately, the audio sound did not come through. Now, I always do a backup from my phone when I do interviews, and what you are about to hear is the backup. I did not feel good about going back to Matt and asking for another interview. He was gracious with his time. He has moved on, and yet he was still willing uh, to give and sacrifice his time. And as I listen to the interview, you can hear everything. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. I'm going to warn you. I'm also going to tell you it is worth it. If you need to not listen to this in the car and wait until you're in a quiet room on your computer with your headphones, folks, I'm telling you this interview is worth every word. I can't tell you how many of my clients come to me and ask me, Dustin, how do I get to the point that I can retire or sell my office? Folks, this episode tells it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for your time. I am so sorry that uh, we had technical problems, but folks, trust me. It is worth waiting until you can hear every word of this interview. It will change your life. It'll change your future. It'll change your retirement. It'll change everything about what you're doing. And now on to the interview. Originating from deep inside the Rocky Mountains, transported through the power of the internet and arriving inside your tiny earbuds. It's the Appraiser Coach Podcast, helping appraisers increase their efficiency, quality, and make more money. Here's the guy who makes it his life's mission to create value for real estate appraisers nationwide. Your host and the Appraiser Coach, Dustin Harris. Welcome back to the program, everyone. Dustin Harris, the appraiser coach, hanging out with you in the podcast chair. I want to do a quick shout out to each of our sponsors. Uh, thank you to OREP Insurance. Uh, OREP has your back, folks. If you're with any other e and I highly recommend that you check out OREP, O-R-E-P.org. Again, it's OREP.org. We're sponsored, of course, by Ala Mode. Ala Mode helping appraisers to do more, helping appraisers to have the tools at their fingertips that they need to do their jobs. Alamode.com or 800 Alamode. And finally, we are sponsored, of course, by Datamaster. Datamaster is helping appraisers to save 30 to 60 minutes per report with the great technology that they provide. You can check them out by going to datamasterusa.com. Again, it's datamasterusa.com. Well, folks, I want to uh, reintroduce you to a good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Matt Friendaway out of uh, the Utah area. Matt uh, has been a member of my dream team for a very, very long time. Uh, You've been on the podcast before. But, uh, Matt, first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here, Dustin. I think... Um, if I'm not mistaken, I was your every first your first ever podcast review. So this is a nice <laughs> you, uh, re- reunification. You were the first. Uh, I think we did that at the year anniversary, and you interviewed me. It was the first time I had been interviewed on my own podcast. Uh, in fact, in fact, first and last. So you uh, you hold that. You also hold the title, Matt, of uh, being uh, at least you were the longest running member of the Dream Team. You joined my first Dream Team years ago, but Matt, you lost that status in 2020 when you dropped out. Why'd you drop out of the Dream Team, man? Well, I um, it wasn't because I didn't enjoy the group. I sold <laughs> Um, I sold my appraisal business and, um, and moved on to other ventures, so I, that's why I dropped out. Part of dropping out was sad, but selling the appraisal business was happy. <laughs> All right, my friend. So you've been you've been an appraiser for many many years. I know you've appraised in uh, in different states, most recently in Utah, as we talked about. I know Matt very very well. I know his work. Uh, I've reviewed his work, and uh, he's an excellent appraiser. Why would you sell an appraisal business, Matt? I mean, it, it was successful, right? It was running. Yeah, it was it was running great. You know, I think I have first of all I have to give uh, kudos to you or a big uh, hug of gratitude to you because. I don't think I would have been able to sell my appraisal business without your coaching and mentoring and the companionship um, and associations I made in the, the mastermind groups. But that being said, when I started in the mastermind group, I, I was full disclosure, I think, and said, hey, guys, my ultimate goal here is to be out of the appraisal business. And so, you know, that's what I did. I followed the steps and, and worked on it hard and, and was able to sell it. But why did I sell it? Some people thought I was crazy for selling it because it was making great income. It was more than paying my bills and I wasn't spending a whole lot of time in it per week. But um, ultimately, my passions just end up being elsewhere, um, and so the the aspen or the appraisal business would just kind of keep me back from achieving some other goals and dreams that I had 
for my life, and the praising just wasn't my center of focus anymore. Well, you know, I love this that you're uh, that you're you're being so open because uh, I do remember that the first uh, day I met you, the first uh, first time at least we started the mastermind. I, I think I met you in a workshop previous to that, but uh, but you came in and the first thing you said uh, was something to the effect of, uh, "My goal here is to is to get out of this industry." So uh, it, it took a couple years to get there. But uh, I love the fact that you're talking about passions because we talk on this program quite often about being very passionate about valuation and the appraisal uh, business. And, and uh, I don't think it was something that you hated, right? I mean, you, you obviously stayed with it for, for many, many years, but, uh, but your passions were elsewhere. Yeah, you know, it, it took a while, Dustin. I, I did like appraising. Um, it was, it's been very good to me. Uh, it's been very good to my family. You know, I've been able to live a, a life that a lot of other people haven't been able to um, and with the freedom. So I'm very thankful for the appraisal industry for that. But, you know, it got to be, um, it took probably a year or two to figure out what was wrong. But, you know, I'd come home from a day from appraising and I would just be in a bad mood and I just want to go to bed and be tired and I wouldn't be looking forward to getting up in the morning and going to do it again. Um, and so, and, you know, I just realized that, that the, it just phased out of my life kind of subconsciously. And, and I, I want something in my life that gives me exhilaration, something that I'm excited to wake up to in the morning. You know, I know every business is different, but for the most part, that I'm exhil- exhilarated about and excited about. And, and um, after being kind of in a bad mood for a couple of years, I realized, well, you know, maybe it's the work that I'm involved in. It's just not exhilarating me like it used to anymore. And I should start looking for some other things. And so I did start looking for some other things and took action on it. And I learned that when I was doing these other things in the businesses in my life, I actually was exhilarated and more positive and actually and it was just the light came on it. Okay, um, appraising is maybe not be the best fit for you anymore. It might have been at one time, but it sounds to me like um, your phase your phases in life have moved on. Let's talk about passion for just a little bit. If you don't mind sharing, uh, what, what is your passion? What uh, uh, what drives you now that you've uh, sold your business, moved on? Uh, what What's your day-to-day look like? Well, my day-to-day is, um, well, let's talk about my passion real quick. What's my passion? My passion, I have a couple of passions. Number one is I really enjoy helping people out. Um, I think that's probably a common passion that a lot of people have, and I don't want to be cliche on that, but that really feeds my soul of helping other people out. Another thing that I have a passion for is business. And when I'm talking about business, I'm talking about like building businesses. I really enjoy building businesses, and I really enjoy helping others um, build their businesses, kind of a mentorship. So those are the two things that give me passion as far as work-wise these days. You know, a day in my life is it's, it's a lot more calmer now than it used to be. I, I, I don't have to get to an appraisal appointment anymore. Nobody's waiting on me. And with COVID happening, most of all the business is done on Zoom these days. Mm-hmm. So I wake up in the morning, uh, meditate for about 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, drink my coffee, send my kids um, and my wife off to work and school. And then uh, my day starts talking to people around nine and just business meetings or mentorship meetings throughout the rest of the day until about five. And then I can shut it down and um, go on with the rest of my life, my personal life. Well, that's, that sounds pretty relaxing, man. I think, I think many appraisers are getting a little bit jealous here. It's a slower pace, and um, it, you know I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have to go out of the house and go after show up somebody's house every single day. And so it is, it is relaxing that way. All right, let's talk a little bit about your background, uh, Matt. Tell us a little bit about uh, your beginnings with the appraisal world, and uh, and you know briefly tell us how you built your appraisal business. Um, well, I started in 2004 uh, as a trainee, and I started down in Phoenix, Arizona. My best friend was an appraiser, and he trained me to be an uh, appraiser as well, which I'm super grateful for. And then in um, 2005, when I was about done with my training, my ex-wife was from Utah, and so I decided to move my family up to Utah. Just a better quality of life um, for them, more space, things like that. Um, I grew up in Wyoming, so where they say you can take the, you can take the boy out of the country, but not the country out of the boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so kind of went back to my roots on that. And um, for a year there, I wasn't done training, so I'd commute down to Phoenix. I'd fly down there on Monday mornings, the phrase all week, fly back up to Utah on Friday nights. And I did that for about a year. And once I was trained and licensed, I started my own appraisal practice in Utah in 2006. And from 2006 to 2008, it was great. Um, you know, sure. I, <laughs> those were the good I, years, right? Yeah, those, <laughs> that's right. Those were the good years. Uh, three comps and you're out. <laughs> right. and, um, no 1004MC, way less client conditions, things like that. Um, so they were, they were pretty easy years in the appraisal industry, and then 2008 happened. And kind of me and probably like most other appraisers out there, their world fell apart uh, with the recession and the AMC is coming on board. And, um, you know, it just was a rough, rough time. So I, um, I stuck it out in around 2012, 2013, business started picking up again. And, um, and that's when I met you. I actually, um, you had a, um, a VA service for a while. And yeah, a VA service. that's right. Really, really helped me start to do more volume and focus more on just appraising, not doing all the, uh, all the other stuff. And that was very helpful. And then you phased into, uh, mentoring and coaching. And I just kind of followed you along the way. Um, did your workshop that time and then started the mastermind group, whatever year that was. And from the time I, you started the mastermind group is really when I started focusing on 
scaling my business. I didn't want to go out and do it phrases every day myself anymore. I really enjoyed running the business. Like I mentioned, that's one of my passions. And so I learned through you um, in the mastermind group and other areas on how to scale a business. What I meant by scaling the business is the hiring back off the staff, the schedule appointments, do the research, you know, the data research, um, data input, things like that um, for you so that I could just focus on appraising, um, going out to do inspections, choosing comps, writing the report, making adjustments is what my life came to. And then I, that, once I got that scale, then I realized, okay, well, I can do more volume. I'm limited at my own volume, so I need to hire more appraisers. And so that's why I started focusing on the next level of my business is hiring appraisers to come um, do the appraisals, and I would just be oversee the, the business and also be a mentor to other appraisers for a while. Love it. Great, great story. Uh, talking with Matt Friend the way. Uh, recently sold his appraisal business. When we get back, Matt, I want to talk more about what you're talking about with building the business and specifically what it takes to create a sellable or marketable business. I want to pause here and remind you that we are sponsored by three great companies, one of them being Alamode. Alamode, of course, helping appraisers to do more. The technology, folks, that Alamode will give you, the mobile, the side-by-side view, the addendum writer, the quick list, the, the smart adjust. I, mean, I could go on and on with a number of built-in tools and the integrations into uploading and, and converting the format and everything else, folks, it's all at your fingertips and it's all the mode. If you're with any other company, check them out. Go to allamode.com or call them at 800 allamode. Data Master, uh, speaking of Utah, Matt uh, located in Utah, so is Data Master, a great little company um, that uh, continues to grow and develop and to help appraisers to import data, which will allow them to be able to do more. Folks, I'm telling you, this company will save you 30 to 60 minutes on every report that you do. If you're not with Data Master, check them out. You need to be. DataMasterUSA.com is where you go. DataMasterUSA.com. And finally, your e How often do you think about your e Well, if you're like me, probably, I don't know, once a year when you renew, maybe if uh, if that complaint comes your direction, uh, you want somebody that's in your corner. But folks, you should think about your e It's an important part of your business, and OREP is there to help you. Uh, the benefits that you receive by being a member of the OREP team are enormous. You can find out more by checking them out on their website. It's OREP.org. That's O-R-E-P dot org. And welcome back to the program, everybody. Talking with a good friend of mine, a longtime member of the Dream Team in the Salt Lake Group, uh, Mr. Matt Friendaway. Um, Matt, welcome back to the program. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, deal because I, I get it all the time. Dustin, uh, I would like to sell my business, but let's face it, uh, appraisal businesses can't be sold. It, it is me. I'm the, I'm the business. If I sell the business and, and there's no appraiser there, there's nothing to sell. So talk to me. How do you do that? You, you actually accomplished. You didn't just have a goal. When you joined the dream team, you accomplished your goal. You sold your appraisal business, and now you're completely out of the valuation world. You're into uh, to, to other things. For my listeners who are looking at this and saying this is impossible, talk to them, Matt. Yeah, no, that is a great question. Um, when I hired my business broker to help me sell my business, that was one of the things that he said. He said, oh, "I look at other appraisal businesses, and usually it's a one-man shop, or, or um, all the appraisals come into this one person, and if that person is not there, then what is there to sell?" You know, where's the volume going to come from if the person's not appraising it anymore? And so uh, I thought about that long in advance before my business broker asked me that question. So I set on a path, uh, you know, right around the time I started the mastermind group um, to change that. And there's, there's, um, there's one major thing in appraising where, where uh, appraisers get, um, I guess, tunnel vision, and that's the lender order side. Mm. And it's true that if, if you are relying on lender orders exclusively, then there's only two ways, I mean, there's only really one way to scale your business and have other appraisers do your work, and that's to hire and train people to become appraisers for you, mm-hmm. and then have, and then turn the lender over to them, but the lenders have to agree to put it in their name, of course. Right, right. Um, and so, and that's, that's a great way to go. I, I, I worked hard on doing that side of it, too, but really, you're kind of limited if you're just relying on lender orders. Because they don't send it. You talked about 2000, sorry to interrupt, but you talked about 2006, 2007. Back then, an appraisal order came into a company and then was reassigned or assigned rather in uh, within the company. That's not the case anymore. They, they come in in the appraiser's name and the appraiser can't just choose uh, John Doe in the office to take care of that appraisal. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that, that was nice back in the before 2008. Wasn't it? You, know, you could build a shop and appraiser order, appraisal order comes in from the lender and you just assign it to whichever appraiser is available. It's, I mean, it's actually a real business. I mean, a, a, a lot more easily scalable business those days, and, and those things change because now, now the lender or the MC wants that specific appraiser to um, to to do the appraisal. Now, you know, you can you can have help with those appraisals as well. Um, you know, you just have to do your significant assistance disclos- disclosure in there, but it still limits you um, on how much volume you can accept, and the and, and and it limits you on scaling your business so that if you step out of it, somebody can buy it and it can just run smoothly 
and actually increase in, um, in income when you step out. So, anyways, my point being is that um, I, at that, up at that point in time, a lot of appraisers focused on their business because it's easy to get, but it's not very scalable. So I started, um, I started working hard on obtaining non-lender business, uh, marketing and networking and things like that to get non-lender business. And when I talk about non-lender business, I mean um, appraisals for people that need divorces, um, real estate, um, real estate agents that need a value on the house that what to list it for, or maybe it's a cash offer they need an appraisal, even though there's no mortgage involved. Uh, litigation based um, cases, uh, estate appraisals, if somebody passes away, they need to figure out what their house is worth, so I can put the estate, things like that. I really started focusing on that non-lender side of the business because when an owner comes in on that side of the business, it's like at the old heydays. You can assign it to any appraiser in your office and they can go do it. Right. And um, I think that was really crucial to me being able to scale the business and make it marketable and sellable to, to, to make somebody interested in buying the business because I could step out and we have this non-lender side coming in. And that was one big thing that, that, that makes it makes it more scalable. You know, I would, in a second, when, when you're ready, I would like to tell you what a buyer is looking for in any business um, so that you can match your appraisal business up to it too if you want to sell. There's, there's some certain key criteria that a business needs to, to have I to love, very sellable to somebody. I love that. I want, I want to do that, but I want to hit on a couple of other things quickly. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned one of the ways to grow uh, a sellable or marketable business is to have other appraisers that work together as a team, as a group. But I know you also have spent some time building your, your non-lender as well. Talk to us briefly a little bit more about what that what that entails. Well, it entails, the biggest thing it entails is um, marketing. you got to get out there and market, and you got to spend some money to get your name out there, and you kind of have to create a market in your area. Um, people don't know that there's this, this side of appraisals called, called non-lending. Most people think that an appraiser is just involved when a mortgage transaction is going to happen, and so you got to spend some time and some money on marketing and making um, a need or, or educating people that there is a need for this other side of appraising, and then they'll start using you. So that, you know, that includes you know, going out to... To networking, meaning, meaning real estate agents and attorneys and knocking on doors, letting them know, educating them that there's this whole other side of appraisal business that you could be valued to, valuable to them in. Um, but you got to plan on spending some time in marketing, whether it's you doing it or somebody else doing it. It's got to be spent. And really the first basis is education, educating people that there's a need for it. And then from that point on, it's just keeping relationships going and, and uh, staying in front of face. You talked a little bit about uh, the, the people, law delegation, if you will. You, you mostly were concentrated on other appraisers, but you've got a lot more people working for you than just appraisers. Yeah, that's right. Um, when I sold the business, I had um, I had a branch manager and an appraisal coordinator and uh, two data technicians. And um, so that was my back office. Oh, and then I had a, um, a marketing manager too. So I don't know how many of that, five or six back office staff, and then the rest of the people were appraisers. Most uh, individuals listening to this would, would say, okay, Matt, that's nice for you, but uh, I can't afford all that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. These guys expect to be paid, don't they? They got to be paid. So that was a big step. I'm glad you brought that up. That was that was the thing I had to fight through a few years ago. Um, when I hired my first assistant, I was like, okay, um, I'm going to still do the same amount of volume for a minute. I'm not going to immediately be able to start doing more volume. And so, but I've got to pay this assistant um, a salary to to do this back office work for me. So I had to raise my bills and, and financial matters so that I could afford to take a pay cut. You know, I couldn't afford to pay myself as much as I was anymore because I had to divert some of this income into paying an assistant. And that was a scary thing for me. Um, and it really is kind of taking a leap of faith. I don't know if you've seen the Indiana Jones show where, um, <laughs> where Indiana Jones is saying, he has to hire a uh, cross a crevice. I think it's like he's yeah. out of a cave. He's yeah. on the other side. And, he can't, and it's like there's no walkway or anything. And then he throws some gravel out and, and sees that there's a walkway there. But, you know, there is a leap of faith or a step of faith that one person has to do when they start hiring other people. Um, and that's what I have to do. And every business has to do that at some point in time. But it is, it's, it's definitely a, a, real, um, a real fear uh, that needs to be overcome to go that way. Let's circle back to the question that you brought up earlier, because I think it's an excellent one. As you get ready, as an individual might get ready to sell an appraisal business, uh, what things need to be in place? What what are potential buyers looking for? Well, you know, I think the, big, the best analogy is uh, franchising. And by the way, that's that's where my passion is, and that's where I work in, in these days is in franchising. But if you look at a franchise, let's say, let's just use McDonald's for an example. That's like the most popular franchise out there. Uh, what do you buy when you buy McDonald's? Well, you buy their training systems and their, um, but you buy all their systems, so you don't have to invent them. And so you can just open up McDonald's and follow their system and be up and running. And so that's what needs to be uh, involved in. You got to develop that in your appraisal practice to make it sellable to somebody else. That's what somebody's looking for when they buy it. They want it to be. They want systems to be set up. They want your staff to be set up um, so that they can just jump in and have a turnkey. What systems am I talking about? Like training systems. How are you going to train your back office? You know, you can't rely on yourself in the back office. You've got to develop, mm. you know, training manuals and videos, and it's not that hard, but you got to have to have some type of duplicatable training system for hiring or for get onboarding people and getting them up to, 
the potter. Hiring the system, that's another thing, is you gotta have a system in order to hire, because you're gonna have turnover, whether it's appraisers or back office staff, you're gonna have turnover and have to hire people every once in a while. And you gotta have a system that somebody else can use that's, that's, that's successful in hiring those people. Um, it really helps to have a manager run the appraisal business. People that are buying businesses aren't always, they don't always wanna be owner operators, they don't always wanna be the appraiser running the business, they wanna step in and have a manager run the business and then they just manage the manager. So it's a good idea to have a manager, a capable manager running your business for you and you're just checking up on them every once in a while to make sure they're doing a good job. Um, probably the other biggest thing is you want to have marketing systems in place. How are you going to generate this non-lender revenue? Or if you're just focused on lender revenue, you know, or if that's one of five you're doing, how are you going to generate that? You always got to have something with AMCs and renew your licenses and you know with your AMCs and stuff and what systems you have in place to take care of that. Without you having to do it yourself. That's what the, owner, the new owners are looking for is how are they going to run the business without them or the old owner doing this stuff? So you really, I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to, but you really need to get to the point that you, you are obsolete, right? I mean, you, you basically have to replace yourself. Yes, yeah, scale's kind of a, a big buzzword, and I've used that a few times, but you want to scale yourself out of the business. It doesn't mean you're not the owner anymore. It just means that if you wake up one morning and don't feel like working, the business runs without you, whether you're there or not. Well, I tell you, this is such a, a um, an unusual, unique uh, model that most appraisers just don't even think is possible. Uh, Matt, what did we miss? Is there anything else that you can add to the conversation that might help an individual who may consider, and not just selling a business, but uh, but I would say that all of these principles also relate to, quote-unquote, retiring and moving into what I call the Tier 5 level, meaning you might continue to own the business, but not necessarily be actively involved. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, um, to just like for people to understand and envision what the appraisal business needs to look like is just think about a franchise. I use McDonald's, but there's a lot of other franchises out there. Think about all the things that a franchise has in place. Somebody buys a franchise. That's pretty much what you want to make your business um, into. Um, is you have all these systems developed, just like a franchise does. Because that's really what the new owners are buying. They're buying, they're buying um, the systems. They're buying the um, human resources that you have in place. And then, of course, they're buying the volume that, um, that you have going on. So those, those are the biggest key points, I'd say, in, in when somebody's imagining building a business to sell. Uh, Matt, you started the uh, Dream Team in March. In fact, it was, I looked it up before we, we started here. March 17th of 2014. Uh, as of this recording, we're uh, we're the latter portion of 2020. Um, you know, that's five and a half years. That's a, that's a long process. If somebody, uh, if somebody were looking to sell, and let's say they're just, let's say they're at the same situation you were, uh, and remind us your situation in, in March of 2014. Do you remember uh, your, your setup? Yeah, I do. And this is, this is, what, um, this is right after um, I was, using your VA services and you start the mastermind. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my setup at that time was um, I had one assistant and um, she did my scheduling and she did um, a lot of my data entry. She built my reports for me. Was she full or part-time? She was full-time. Okay. Yeah, she was full-time. So one assistant and I had one other appraiser working with me at that time. Okay. And I started the mastermind. So, so... Help an individual who might be listening to this and saying, okay, I'm in a similar situation to where uh, Matt was uh, March of 2014. Is it really going to take me five and a half years to get to the point that I can sell this business? Um, no, I don't think so. I had, I had other stuff going on in my life. You know, I started other businesses at the same time that I was working on, so I didn't put my full 100% attention focus on um, scaling my business. Um, a person can do it faster, uh, especially if they're part of the mastermind team, too. I'm t- I, I can't tell you how big a part of, that, of my life that was. And, and helping me scale the business and things. Um, and there's some various too with mastermind members now too that are probably going the same route I did. And so the learning curve can be a lot faster with that, uh, with that resource. But yeah, it can be done faster. It doesn't have to take six years. Matt, friend, the way, um, thank you, my friend. What, what's next for you? What, uh, what's your future look like, my friend? Um, I am now a franchise consultant. And so the easiest way to put that out there is that I help, I map people to the right franchise business to buy. So I'm kind of like a, a buyer's real estate agent where they go out and find the, the home for the buyer, mm-hmm. you know, homes that a buyer can afford, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, all that stuff. I do that on a franchise basis. So Very cool. Um, if, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and, and, and maybe is looking at a second business, uh, how would they do that? Um, they would just email me at matt, with two C's, at learn2franchise.com. And it's learn the number two franchise.com. Love it. Matt Friendaway, thank you uh, for, for being a friend. Thank you for your many, many years and your insights. Uh, you know, the great thing about the Dream Team is it's not one-sided. It's uh, It truly is a mastermind where many individuals get together and share insights and help. And, uh, you know, throughout the years, I, I can't tell how many how many times you brought just great, great things uh, to the to the meeting, uh, sometimes physically, uh, <laughs> bringing gifts uh, to everyone in there. and uh, But more importantly, mentally, and just sharing your insights. Uh, you'll be greatly missed, my friend, and I appreciate you taking time today. 
Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me on. And again, I'm super grateful for you and the Mastermind team members in helping me get this done the past six years. That's Matt Friend away on selling an appraisal business. Folks, if you are interested in being a part of the Dream Team, of course, we have seven of them across the country, one of them online. Uh, would love to have you be a part of that to a great group. Uh, reach out to me, the coach at theappraisercoach.com, or if you want to find out more, go to theappraisercoach.com, click on memberships, and all the information is there. Thank you so much, and we will catch you next time. You've been listening to the Appraiser Coach Podcast with Dustin Harris. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and post a short review on iTunes. For more in-depth insider information on how you can make more money as a real estate appraiser, visit theappraisercoach.com and sign up for the All-Star Team today. Thanks for joining us. And now, get out there and create some value.